So just finished teaching in uh, Sweden. We had our two retreats there, and prior to that, I had a retreat in. <laughs> prior to that, I had a retreat in America. So I basically for this summer done uh, eleven days in America, followed by ten days in Sweden of Nagong, then another ten days of meditation or alchemy. So it amounted to <laughs> thirty-one days of full-time teaching, in which I had uh, assistance from many other uh, very skillful members of the school to help me out with teaching, but basically I was full-time teaching for 31 days, with a few days off in the middle, here and there, but it, it, it was hard going. <laughs> I don't mind admitting that I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a little bit tired, I'm a little chi deficient from the amount of um, chi emission that has to be used to assist the people that I'm teaching as well, so I'm a little <clears throat> throaty, which is normal for chi deficiency. But um, that's okay. It's normal, you know, to do this much over the summer and then uh, recover now, which is what I'm doing. I'm in a hotel in London at the moment, just chilling out. Tomorrow we mostly spent a little bit at the gym and then at the spa and maybe swimming pool, something like that. I shall take it easy and uh, start the recovery process. It was good. It was good fun. Uh, we had 300 people. Um, across the retreats, 120 in America, I think, something like that. Um, didn't count exactly. Maybe uh, 100 on each of the two Swedish ones. So 300 people overall over the summer um, for the retreat, which is really cool to have that many people. And very interesting to meet that many people and see what they're doing. It's really, it's really fun actually. It's uh, it, it was like when I started teaching. I remember when I first started teaching my. <laughs> one of my friends said to me, because I'm quite intense, I'm naturally quite intense, that's who I am. When I train, it's intense. When I do things, it's intense. I've got quite an intense nature. I remember when I was younger, girlfriends would leave me because I was too intense. <laughs> like, that's who I am. Everything is full on, you know. And uh, I tried to temper it a little bit because um, maybe it's a little ADHD sometimes or something like that. But <laughs> it's, <laughs> my approach to the arts was always the same. It's like I piled my intensity into practice. And I remember one of my friends, um, a lady named Cindy, uh, who, who I'm still very good friends with, when I started teaching, one thing she said to me, I remember, is you'll be very niche, you know, it'd be a very small school because most people won't want to study Qigong or Tai Chi the way you, you want to do it. And I, I, I remember saying at the time, well, okay, yeah, sure, like I'll, <laughs> I'll just have a small school because I won't simplify anything and I can't make something more gentle. I don't really have a great not great with people, <laughs> so I'm not very good at sort of compromising to adjust to their needs or keeping people happy. So I just kind of, right from the beginning, taught what I do and didn't worry if it was too intense or, or too much. And so, yeah, I always imagined it would be quite niche, but nope, <sighs> nope, turns out not. Like uh, Lotus Snake Gong, the school I run is, is pretty big, 300 people this summer. Um, but that's, you know, only a fraction of the school. That doesn't include the students of the other teachers and things. I mean, across the school, there's, there's many, many hundreds of members of Lotus Nagong studying this, this system with me. That doesn't include the online stuff. And so what it turns out is that actually people don't necessarily want something that's simplified. They don't necessarily, not everybody wants these sort of 15 minute quick fix exercise. You can do 10 minutes a day and your lungs will get better five minutes a day and your health will improve. Most people don't want that, it seems, or a lot of people don't want it. If you actually present to them something traditional, um, quite hard work, something that has a bit of oomph behind it, you know, something that takes a lot of effort and, and perhaps a lot of sort of input, a lot of time put into it, you know, in order to master this art. It turns out there's a lot of people hungry for that. A lot of people are looking for that more than your, your sort of modern marketers <laughs> may assume. So I've never really made any effort to adjust anything. I just teach how I train, really. Teach what I was taught and teach how I train. And, and yeah, it turns out there's a lot of people want that. So I find that, um, that gives me hope, actually, because I find the watering down or the simplification of things a bit, I don't know, depressing. <laughs> on some level, I suppose. I suppose that's the word. I'm not actually depressed by it, but I guess the the oversimplification of everything across the board, let's make yoga accessible. Let's make it so dumb it's accessible to everybody. Let's make Qigong so dumb it's accessible to everybody. And Tai Chi so watered down and stupid that anyone can do it with no effort whatsoever. I find all that really depressing. I think that <laughs> everyone should be able to try something, of course. But um, 
the gateway to being able to do something should be personal effort and striving in order to get the hang of it, just like any other art, any other practice that you, you do. And the fact that, uh, you know, contrary to how a lot of society is going, where people think want things easier, people want things more convenient, people want things with no effort, people feel entitled on the whole to, to just have things without any kind of input of effort on their own part, you know, with no commitment from them. It's actually quite nice that there's <laughs> something that's kind of an antithesis to this way of being, antithesis, antithesis to the modern way, you know, and it's being embraced. I mean, that, that, that's, that gives me hope. You know, that gives me hope. People are embracing a traditional art that takes a lot of hours to, de to develop and a, a lot of personal input. Fantastic. So that's been good. And it's funny, actually, because uh, one of the things that, that I told people, and, and people, anyone who's trained with me for a while will know, the one thing that, that I've wanted out of for a long time is teaching, actually, uh, out of the um, sort of <laughs> the 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 strives the stresses the tr sort of trials and tribulations that come with running a school that come with running an organization if i could just literally teach it it'd be fine but of course nothing is as simple as that when you teach there's always other stuff involved there's other stuff in the background for a school there's the complications of dealing with with people and i've done it for a long time now like a really long time i'm getting older i'm getting old older i don't know however you want to say it and uh <laughs> i've been teaching for a while and, and all this time, during all these years, I've always tried to be a better teacher and get better at it. So there's a lot of input, a lot of mental energy for me into this role. It's not just a, a job for me, far from it. Like, it's something that I strive to be the best that I possibly can at. And in order to do that, that means I have to be able to do the absolute best for the people I teach, as well as maintaining my skill level to as high a level as I possibly can in these arts. So it's, it's very labor-intensive. Um, and there's been a large part of me for many years that's wanted to step back from it all because um, I don't need to teach. There's no reason. There's no financial reason for me to do it. There's no, I'm not obligated in any way. Um, my ego is <laughs> long grown up beyond the stage of needing the recognition or anything. So it, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing there for me in that. So part of me, a large part of me is always wanting to just kind of go, you know, what I'll step back and and and, and maybe just teach some seniors and, and get on with my own practice. But then I finish these retreats and I always feel the opposite. That's the problem, isn't it? You get to the end of a retreat and all right, you're tired. I'm pretty tired. But um, I think for me, it's because I speak to people and, and when they speak to you, they so many people tell you, well, a couple of things. One about the differences it's made in their life. Now, I'm not someone who believes in endorsements or, or, or sharing anecdotal stories I always think they're a bit pointless so it's not like oh this cured my injury or this cured my ailment and, and sometimes I think teachers <laughs> if I were to be cruel hear those kind of things from a student and they get all excited oh can you write it down can you video it can you tell us about it so we can sort of sell what we do and and part of me thinks well they must be kind of <laughs> few and far between for you to jump on those things as an endorsement but the, the, to me it I think they're very personal for that student. I think that that's something that's happened and it's not necessarily guaranteed it's going to happen to anyone else. So therefore, the endorsement's kind of pointless. So I don't bother with any of that. But, it, but I do listen to the stories that people give you about the, the physical ailments that the training has improved or, or more importantly to me, probably more pertinently to me is the psychological issues that the training has helped with. And sometimes it's the system itself. Sometimes it's a method, but quite often it's just the act of committing to something, or maybe it's the act of, or the, or the, the nature of being a part of a community, or maybe it's the nature of studying a different side of reality. Like it doesn't even have to be the exercises necessary, but people can derive great psychological benefit from it. So when you hear these kind of stories, and so many people have them, it's like, okay, well, actually, maybe what I'm doing is good for people, and maybe there's a, there's a purpose for me there. You know, because I'm not personally someone who needs fun. You know, I think a lot of people are aiming to be happy in life or to have fun, aren't they? And it's never really been my thing. Like, if I want to have fun, I go out and, you know, cause some trouble or something. <laughs> still that within me or I'll go do something stupid. But I don't need to be happy all the time in my life or whatever. It's not that I'm unhappy or that 
it's just irrelevant to me. Like, am I happy? Or am I not? I, I don't know. I don't care. It's irrelevant. I'm more interested in having a purpose. That gives me the direction I need. I have a purpose in life. Something that I'm supposed to do that, yeah, that keeps me going and, and, and <laughs> gives me what I need, you know, satisfies me. So when I hear these kind of stories or whatever, these tales from people about the benefits it's given them, it's difficult because it gives me that purpose. And then it's like, it reminds me that's why I'm teaching. And it, it's funny as well that, uh, <laughs> it's funny that you get these endorsements or uh, the endorsements is the wrong word, isn't it? You get these sort of thankful or gratitude messages all the time, or we get them online, people send them on social media, or they email, they write in, say they had these experiences or these benefits from it. <clears throat> and I guess it's always a bit depersonalized to me because I'm 42 or 3, one or the other, and I grew up at an age without the internet. Like, the internet didn't exist when I was younger. And also, because I was always traveling in Asia, I never really got into the internet when it came around. So actually, I was a late comer to the internet. So by the time, I remember one time coming back from Asia and everybody had, like, cameras and phones and internet all integrated and stuff, and uh, I felt so lost and so left behind. So I've never, I, I never really sort of was there in the early stages of the internet, you know. Never really grabbed me. And the internet for me has always just been something that's connected very much to the school. So I've never known the internet outside of Lotus and Gong, really. That's kind of, for me, that's what it all is, all integrated into the same thing. <clears throat> so therefore, because I didn't grow up with it, I guess it doesn't have the same power to me. So these tales people tell you when they send you these things, saying, well, I'm really grateful that you've done this or whatever, they, they're kind of depersonalized. And that's going to sound a bit rude, especially to the people who've sent me those messages. But please don't think that. It's not that I'm... I'm I'm happy to read them and it's nice to read them, but they don't have much impact on me because they're just, they're written, they're written words on the internet and they don't seem real. Like I don't connect the real person with what's said on the internet to me. They're, they're separate things. It's like I'm watching something on TV, you know, if I watch a person on TV, I don't feel like I know that person. I'm not connected to that person because that's not real life. It's on the TV and the internet's like that for me. So it always kind of brings it home when I speak to people in real life and they tell you, face to face about these stories because I'm like okay yeah this is real now this is this is an actual person that's telling me that I've had I can't really get comfy in this chair <laughs> so personally that they've had a, a benefit from this practice so that's great so that you know <laughs> there's always that fight within me the part of me that wants to quit teaching but then the part of me that recognizes that actually there's a huge amount of purpose that I derive from the benefit that these arts can give you know and I don't know if I'll ever make peace with that. Maybe the, maybe the slight discomfort at teaching is good for me anyway, because I'm uncomfortable with being a teacher. It forces me to try to get better. So maybe, maybe that's not a terrible thing anyway. Like I think it's like in the previous video I put on here, I put something, previous video I was talking about martial arts and violence. And if you haven't seen it, what I was saying that was because I had committed some violent acts when I was younger and I recognized that there is still the potential for violence within me, not that it ever comes out, but the potential is there, that I deliberately allow myself to maintain a little guilt, a little sense of guilt about some things I did in the past, because that guilt is a deliberate tool to keep a check on who I am and on my behavior. And it was amazing how many emails and messages we got saying like, you know, trying to essentially reassure me or give me comfort saying, you know, that, sorry that I'm struggling and I should come to terms with the guilt and I hope I find peace or something and people recommending different therapies and they didn't understand like it's the guilt that I'm allowing myself to feel it's not a problem it doesn't plague me I don't need therapy I don't even need to be at peace with it the concept of being at peace is irrelevant to me it doesn't matter like it's being at peace and being happy are irrelevant to me because they're not something that I struggle with so if you struggle with something it's a problem if you don't struggle with something it's not a problem it's no different than if you have somebody coming into a clinic who has some people come into a chinese medical clinic and have a bad back and it's the worst thing in the world some people come into a chinese medical clinic and they've got so many other things going on their life oh yeah yeah i got a bad back as well but it's no big deal it's only like that with other psychological traits as well so the fact that i allow myself to still feel some of these what other people would deem negative is deliberate tool by myself to keep myself in check because I don't see those qualities as negative because they don't have a negative impact upon me. And it's the same I would say with the teaching is that I don't have to come to 
It's like even an irrelevant word. I don't have to make peace with being a teacher because I don't feel unpeaceful by <laughs> having slight discomfort with it. Like it, it's like even the words are wrong. It's like <laughs> so that feeling of like never having come to terms with being a teacher is good for me. It's good for me. I hope I explained that okay. It's like somebody asked on the course, you know, like <laughs> we were doing a meditation course, somebody was asking about pain, and they said, does pain ever go away? And I said, well, I don't really know what you mean by pain, because by pain, you're implying something that's negative. What I'm saying is that the more I go into this practice and the more I see the root of what something is, it's, it's not negative anymore. It's simply a sensation. So therefore, if it's simply a sensation and it's not negative anymore, because I don't have that bias applied to it, does it count as pain? Do you call it pain? What makes something pain? Is it the feeling or is it the negative emotion or the negative sensation or the negative categorization that you've put upon it? You know, like all of the, those kind of concepts are something that are very important to explore, I think, um, on the path of cultivation or in the internal arts. Anyway, off topic. So <laughs> that's that was one interesting thing with teaching. But the other thing that was interesting in teaching, of course, was that I've been really, wow, this chair is really uncomfortable. How do, you, how do you sit in a chair? I'm not bad at Tai Chi. I'm all right at alchemy. I'm not bad at Nei Gong, you know, but I can't master sitting in a chair. I've never figured out these mics either. So <laughs> I got some basic skills to develop. Yeah, the other thing that happened, I was, because I was so busy, um, I mean, I'm always busy anyway, aren't I? Running a school in Bali, doing this, that, and the other, you know, managing Lotus Nei Gong, plus other businesses that I run. <laughs> There's always a lot going on, but this 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 month, in order to teach full time all those days um, between America and then and then Europe, I was disconnected from the internet completely. I was really bad on my own schools forums and groups. We have private groups and forums that the students talk on, and I basically abandoned it for a month, which I'm sure they did fine. I'm sure many of the seniors in my school answered the questions fine, so it's okay. But I was completely disconnected from the internet, full stop, meaning I didn't see any of the stuff that's going on on social media, saw nothing on YouTube really, nothing that was going on Facebook, nothing that's going on in any of them, any of these places, you know, whatever they are, all these different social me media fucking brainwashing platforms that we all adhere to these days. And I didn't see any of it for a month. And, and it was really interesting for me that actually by not seeing any of the social media associated with martial arts or the martial arts community, because of course that's what I see, I see the Facebook groups on Tai Chi and the Facebook groups on Qigong and the YouTube videos and, and the long streams of comments about martial arts and you hear all the, all the stories about what the teachers are up to and, and they're talking about this, that and their schools and what have you. Because I didn't see any of that for a month, I actually ended up developing a higher degree of faith in the martial arts world and <laughs> in the internal martial arts world. Now, it, some people are bothered by the abuse that they personally get, and I get some. I don't get that much. I get some people make YouTube videos about me sometimes, or somebody made a website about me recently, or people put some stuff on Facebook. And there's probably other stuff I haven't seen. I'm sure there's forums with stuff in, but it's still not that much compared to some other people. And my friend Adam, he gets he gets a bit of shit. Um, and my friend Joey causes himself quite a lot of shit as well, actually. So, that, you know, some people get more than me. But um, none of it's ever bothered me, actually. Like, that doesn't bother me so much. I think that's just a part of being in the public eye. Um, but the other stuff that bothers me more, actually, is the stuff I'm not directly involved in. So when you're reading conversations between teachers, you know what I mean? If you go on a forum, you go on a Facebook group, and you're reading all these teachers talking to each other, you know, or, or shouting at each other, what you realize is that social media is largely just full of people wanting to sort of vent their opinions, really, and the, especially these groups, these Facebook groups that have replaced forums, really, haven't they? And people are venting their opinions, and a lot of older guys, like it's weird, older than me, sort of in their 50s and stuff, angrily shouting at people, which I think is really odd, <laughs> really, really strange, especially Facebook, isn't it? It tends to have an older crowd, Boomer Book or something like that, where all these people just having to go at each other. And it's, even though it's not directly aimed at me and it doesn't involve me, I think just reading all the bickering and the back and forth and also the lack of knowledge people have, 
for fear of sounding horribly arrogant, people don't know a lot about these arts. Like there are some that do, and you see them write something, it's like, okay, yeah, that person really knows their subject actually, but there's a lot that don't. And there's some that don't that have been in the public eye for a long time and actually have quite a name for themselves and they still don't know anything. It's amazing. I don't know how they got to the position they have with the lack of knowledge that they have. And then you see them do something, and the lack of skill kind of goes with it. So you have all this kind of back and forth. And I guess even though it's not directed to me, it's them talking to each other. It, I was following it for a while, you know, and I think it got to a stage where it actually put me off the arts entirely. Like, it completely put me off, put me off the arts. So don't get me wrong, it's not the things aimed at me, it's, it's the general state of the way people communicate with each other. It may have got me to the point of realising or thinking that the, the internal arts world was just full of horrible, bickering, stupid, unintelligent, rude just nasty people and I and I was just I wanted away from it so I was telling people around me you know like that's it I'm out I want nothing to do with this nothing to do in a martial art world the Qigong world it's like I'm embarrassed to even be associated with the Qigong world people outside of of this world ask me what I do you know you're at a social dinner or something what do you do and I'm like uh medicine Chinese medicine <laughs> like I don't want to say Qigong I don't want to say Tai Chi I don't want to say Kung Fu because the way people in this world, communicate with each other on social media means, oh, I'm, like, it's like I'm embarrassed. It's like, oh, they might assume I'm one of those people. They might assume that I'm like that. So I'll be guilty by association. So it got to the point where I found it just so distasteful. And, th <laughs> and that's where I sat with it, really. And But I didn't really even realize that was what was happening. I knew I just disliked most people in the Qigong and Tai Chi world. And I'm also aware by making this video, I certainly won't make any friends. But I, I was aware that I disliked the majority of people in the Qigong and Tai Chi world, that I was reading what they were writing and the way they were talking to each other. Just no manners. And very um, sort of effeminate in their attacks on each other. You know, like just no, no honor. You know, it's almost like they're trying to wow, gouge each other's eyes out, boys, on, on Facebook. And I didn't realize that that was actually getting to me to the degree it was. And then having this month off of social media, off of Facebook, or more to the point, it's not the social media so much as just being away from all of those people's influence, made me realize that actually I still really love these arts. And most of the people that I meet through these um, communities, through Lotus Negong or through other stuff, or oh, this chair is terrible. Hang on a minute. I'll try and make some... Excuse my fidgeting. It's like, it's designed for a weird shaped bum. Um, yeah, so I guess like being away from it for a month reminded me, like say, of all these, actually most of the people I meet in real life are really nice. Like the internet's not real, is it? Like people don't talk to each other like that in real life. And everybody I meet is really interesting and really has a lot to say and has some cool ideas about these arts and they've got good experiences. Um, and the conversations are really interesting, and it doesn't match the reality of, of social media and the people on it. And it made me realize, when I speak to a lot of these people that are quite decent, they don't comment on these groups, and it made me realize, actually, that a lot of the, the groups, these Facebook groups, these forums, are just full of, like, bitter people who feel inferior because they never really got what they wanted from these arts. They never really, well, they certainly never found any kind of contentment or they wouldn't be attacking people like they did but I think more to the point they never really got the level of recognition they wanted because I think a lot of these people what they want is you know like in a very masculine way I think they want status and they want recognition and they're not getting it um, you see their classes it's like five or six disinterested people following along and you know those five or six people in their class aren't going to be there in six months and there'll be another five or six people and then they'll leave and then they have this constant turnover of disinterested people because they can't inspire them in any way these people are coming into a class and finding nothing inspiring in the practice certainly nothing inspiring in the people i mean if i went to a school and i started even studying with the teacher and i found out my teacher was on Facebook groups saying, I don't like this and I don't like that and I don't like you, just everywhere, all over social media, just attacking people, being rude, you know, calling people names. I'd leave the teacher because I would think, well, there's nothing inspiring in that person. They don't inspire me. That I, I don't want to train with someone who is what I don't want to be. And I think that's what happens. And I think a lot of these people that I see that are just creating this bad vibe around these, these arts, 
that's part of the reason why they're not inspiring people. That's part of the reason why they're not getting what they want, which is the recognition and the status and the, the big following. So therefore, they attack people that they see who they think have this big following or attack people they think have, they have status because they, they just they look at that and they, they think it makes them, well, it, it exacerbates their feeling of inferiority. And, and, you know, that's never very nice. If you already feel inferior, then somebody comes along and makes you feel more, more inferior. That, that's, a, you know, that's, that's like salt in the wound, isn't it? So having this month off away from it has made me realize, actually, it's not my world. That's not my world. That's not the people I know. That's not the people I meet. That's not the inspiring people that that come along and have a go at these arts. And it's not the inspiring people that that I make a choice to meet socially outside of my courses because I find those people inspiring, you know. And so what it's meant is, yeah, my school will now move towards separating itself from public social media. I will start to move my accounts away from the public and uh, I certainly won't have anything to do with any public groups and I need to get rid of profiles so that people can't link me into stuff because that's what happens when you're on social media. Someone's tagged you in something and you kind of can't help reading it and ugh, it's like I don't really care. So I want out of all that. I still post things on YouTube. I think YouTube's all right, actually. Um, generally, YouTube's okay. It doesn't have that same kind of vibe back and forth and also because people are normally commenting under your own video then it's not you're not spying on other people's conversations between each other if you get what I mean like you often won't see on Facebook it's like voyeuristically watching two pissed off people have a go at each other and you don't tend to get that on YouTube so much so I'll, I'll still post things on YouTube but I'll increasingly start to move more and more away from social media because it made me realize that I don't I don't need that reality and I would say as well I would say if you're someone who is connected into all of these things which I felt I needed to as a teacher of these arts felt I needed to know what's going on turns out I don't it uh, and it's making you feel negative I would suggest stepping away from it as, as well because once you're not seeing it it doesn't impact your life it has no impact upon your life and to me it has no impact upon my view of then the internal arts world so therefore my reality or what I feel about people in the internal arts world can actually be dictated or, or I can decide what I think about people from people I actually meet rather than people I don't know who I'm seeing on a format that I don't really connect with yeah and I and I guess that might sound obvious or simple but I it's quite a major thing for me because I don't want to be embarrassed to be connected with the internal arts world and, and if, if you take those two groups of people the people that I see online bickering and then the people that I meet, I'm embarrassed to be associated with those people online that are bickering. I'm embarrassed by them. Like, they are cringeworthy. These people talking on Facebook groups, and I'm aware, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm being less polite than I usually am, but a bit more harsh. They, they remind me, they're so cringe. It's like, it reminds, going on an internal arts Facebook group reminds me of, if you ever... If you've ever heard someone singing karaoke on the car stereo, I don't know why that example comes to my mind, and you're, they're so bad, you're embarrassed for them. And then someone sort of hears that you're listening to it on the stereo and it gives you a feeling of cringe. Maybe you know that feeling, like a true sort of cringe. Like That's what the Facebook groups and the forums about internal arch tai chi and qigong make me feel cringeworthy. It's like watching people do bad karaoke. And that's <laughs> why it's like embarrassing to be associated with with those people. It's like, I'm not like them. That's not what I do. They're doing a different thing. But then the people that I meet and the people I meet in real life, I don't get that feeling from at all. Like not at all. They, they're pleasant, inspiring, open, um, caring people. I don't have to put more words upon it. They're, they're interesting to know and, and I actually feel blessed to have those kind of people in my life. And I'm not embarrassed to be associated with those people. So <laughs> by cutting out the cringe people, it actually feels a bit more like, um, yeah, like, it, it, you know, it's a way to re-inspire yourself into the kind of community in, in general. And I, I guess I needed that month away from it all for me to really see that. Because the joke is, I'm not even, like... I'm not even someone who's usually involved in those groups. I don't really comment on them. I don't join in the conversations. I don't spend hours on them. I just have a passing look 
every now and then, maybe it's every other day or every third day, I just have a quick look through the Facebook groups to see what's going on. And that's it. That is the extent of my involvement. So I'm not even massively involved in them. I don't spend ages watching other people's YouTube videos. I tend to watch Adam's to see what's going on there. And I watch Joey's, Joey Nishad, see what he's been up to. And he's all over the world doing odd things, um, which is cool. And I watch some other people, but there's not many. There's not some, I, I'm not even that involved. So how would I feel? Like how much cringe factor would I feel if I was hugely involved? That's the question. Because some people are. Some people are hugely involved. You see them commenting, they like just <laughs> post after post after post. And I'm thinking, wow, that's taken up a lot of mental energy. So even my minimal involvement is enough for me to feel embarrassed by the internal arts world. Um, <laughs> And yes, I'm aware that this video might cause me some problem. So yeah, that was my takeaway from this month, really. Because I always think that, like, you get to the end of a month and of teaching, 31 days. It was, spread, it was spread over, like, six weeks, but 31 days. And yeah, I'm pretty depleted. I'm pretty tired. My body feels a bit more flaccid than it usually is <laughs> in a bad way. There's no chi. I feel a bit more deflated. and um, But all good, you know, whatever. And a couple of injuries I picked up, my knee and the ankle, eh, whatever, no big deal. Um, but within a few days, I'll be back to normal and, and that's all good. Uh, so aside from that, when I do these long periods of teaching, I always like to think, you know, what have I learned during this time or, or how has it been and, and to consider it. And actually, the things I told you then, those were my biggest takeaways. My two biggest takeaways is actually I derive a lot of purpose from this, um, from the teaching, a lot of purpose. I, I really do enjoy sharing. I do enjoy helping people. I do enjoy providing a service. I enjoy being useful. That's it. That's the purpose for me. And then the other side of it was that actually, yeah, there's no need for me to even watch what the rest of the internal arts world is doing because truth be told, I don't care. I'm happy doing what I'm doing and I'll, I'll carry on. That's it. That's my takeaways from this year. And I guess to some people that might seem rather minor, but to me they're kind of major actually. Those are quite major things for me to uh, come to terms with and major things to realize and I should move forward <laughs> with that logic. Day after tomorrow I fly back. Oh, tomorrow? Day after tomorrow. Whatever. I should probably figure out so I don't miss my flight. I fly from here, London, back to um, Bali and then I'm back into the the, the training with the students out there and yeah that's cool and, and I want to I'm, I'm looking forward to it and uh, I'll get back to the podcast as well where I got some other guests coming in I've actually got some more more time so I'll, I'll record some of those but uh, yeah be good to get back to Bali and get back to Asia back to the chaos of, of Ubud where I live and uh, <laughs> back into the martial arts training that we're doing up there and I think actually now what I'll start to do if people are interested is start to include some clips of some of our training because normally I have a I have an online school where people can see all kinds of footage of me but on, on YouTube I normally just talking on it YouTube's my platform for just chatting shit and <laughs> sharing my thoughts isn't that what YouTube's for as far as I could make out but um yeah I, I I will start to share some footage of some of our training I think um so people can see what we're up to because uh, it's maybe our training is not quite what people would expect but we'll see <laughs>